Hello, everybody. Um, welcome, welcome. Please let us know where you're tuning in from. My name is Natasha Kimani, and I am the head of partnerships and research at Africa No Filter. I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. It is my absolute pre pleasure today to be um, moderating the conversation on creating global audiences for your visual art with Sotheby's. And I am joined by an expert in this conversation and in this particular space, Hannah O'Leary. She's a senior ed director, head of modern and contemporary African arts at Sotheby's. Um, Hannah, welcome. Thank we you, beyond, Natasha. We are beyond excited to have <laughs> you. Um, this is an exciting time for us. And um, if you will allow me, I'll just briefly uh, delve into your bio, but I'm hoping uh, we already have an audience before I do so. How are you doing, Hannah? Are you enjoying the summer wherever you are? Uh, very much so. We don't get much of a summer in London, but um, I'm making the most of it for sure. Fantastic. <laughs> um, Hannah O'Leary first joined Sotheby's in 2005, initially working in the Dublin and Melbourne offices. In 2006, she joined Bonhams in London, where she helped pioneer the first international auctions of South African art and modern contemporary African art, becoming head of department in 2010. With 10 years experience in this field and having overseen record-breaking sales in both categories, she was delighted to return to Sotheby's in 2016 to further develop this burgeoning market. Since then, Sotheby's has consistently dominated this market, breaking over 200 world record prices artists from the continent, including Marlene Dubas, Dumas, $6 million, Julie Merhetu, $5 million, and Jindeka Akunili, I have really massacred that name and I apologize, $3 million amongst many others. Hannah maintains close relationships with private collectors and public institutions alike, often advising on their collections and acquisitions. In 2022, she raised over 2 million pounds for institutions supporting African artists, including the Center for Contemporary Art, Lagos, Novel Foundation Cape Town, the International Studio and Curatorial Program, in New York and Brandwin Workshop and Archives in Philadelphia. She has participated in many private sales and exhibition loans worldwide, including acting as an international consultant to the South African National Gallery. She has written on the subject of contemporary African art for various publications and lectured at events and institutions internationally, including the Royal Academy London, the Kunsthaus, Tel Aviv Museum of Art, amongst many others. Um, she holds a master's degree in history of art with cultural anthropology from Glasgow University. Hannah, um, what a phenomenal bio. <laughs> We're excited to have you. I'm mind blown. This has been, I've been looking forward to this conversation. I'm excited. I will ask the audience, please let us know your name, where you're from, um, and, 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 I would really ask that you, we are going to launch uh, the poll questions um, um, and I will ask that you answer the poll questions um, and let us know, you know, um, what describes you, what level of experience do you have and what's your biggest challenge as an artist? Let us know where you're from, who you are. And also as Hannah continues with her presentation, I'll ask that you use the Q and A space um, to ask your questions, not in the chat box, but use the Q&A chat box. Hannah, it is my ultimate pleasure to hand over to you because I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Oh, wow. Well, thank you so much, Natasha, for that introduction. And thank you to the whole Africa No Filter team for inviting me to be here today. Um, it's a platform that I really love. I'm honored to be here speaking to your audience. And in particular, um, I'm, I'm very lucky I do get invited to, to speak publicly. Uh, what I'm excited about today's talk is speaking specifically to artists, because I think a lot of practitioners will often hear me speak about the market, but also thinking more, usually I'm ad addressing collectors, right? So I'm really excited today to be um, addressing first and foremost, the artists themselves. 
slightly intimidating, I have to say. But um, I love this platform. I love what a wide reach we have. I'm excited to see where everyone is calling in from. Um, I'm going to go through a presentation which is um, quite casual. I have some visuals. I'll talk a little bit about myself in the market and maybe some case studies or some tips that um, practitioners should be thinking about when it comes to their practice, but also the business side of their practice. Um, but of what I'm really excited about is the Q&A at the end. So I'll definitely encourage people to ask me lots of questions. Whatever tricky, difficult um, questions they can think of, I will do my very, very best to answer them. Um, so shall I launch without further ado? Is that the idea? Okay, great. Absolutely. <laughs> Bear with me, everyone. I am not the most technically able, but I am going to share my screen. So hopefully everyone can see this wonderful holding um, photograph of um, Sotheby's galleries here in London. So as was already said that I am the head of African art or contemporary African art at Sotheby's Auction House in London. Um, this is our uh, historic headquarters. Our main headquarters today are in New York City. Um, we are the biggest auction house in the world. We're one of the most visited um, art businesses online in the world. Um, I'm very, very excited that I'm with such a um, powerful company or art brand when it comes to promoting Africa. So I feel huge privilege in doing that. And as Natasha mentioned, I've been in the business in the auction business for 20 years, in the contemporary African business for 18 years. Um, I don't know everything, I'm not saying I do, but I have had a huge amount of experience in a field which is relatively new on the global scale, uh, stage. So I hope some of that experience and some of the points that I'm going to cover today um, will be interesting and relevant for this audience. Um, I, I, I think this is being recorded, so I hope some people get to pause on this slide. It's a very, very dense slide. Uh, this is a slide I worked with Art News to produce on an article they were writing about contemporary African art. But basically where we've come since 1992 being the first biennial in Dakar in Senegal. When I was invited to join Sotheby's and actually when I was with Bonhams before that, uh, the, the reason that we started sales dedicated to art from the continent was because the continent had been very much overlooked by the art market uh, for most of the 20th century and actually increasingly into the 21st century. So we were not, certainly when I was at university, we weren't talking about Africa. I didn't know many African artists. It was really on the job that I have um, learned everything I know about African art and artists. Um, I did not study it at university. I have a very traditional art history degree. Um, but it's a mistake. And I think it's a mistake that's still being made um, in the education system today. We still don't have many art history degrees that are incorporating um, histories of art on the African continent, even in um, tertiary education on the continent itself. So that's something that still needs to change. But there have been significant moments and significant game changers in the last 30 years, which have got us to where we are today. So things like the biennials starting in the 1990s with Dakar and Johannesburg and incorporating African countries into the Venice Biennale, for example. So South Africa was invited back to the Venice Biennale in 1995 after the um, end of apartheid. Um, right through to uh, Africa 95, which was a significant um, African art and culture celebration here in London in 1995, Africa Remix in 90, or 2004, um, the starting of the African art auctions, which I've already mentioned, but also African art fairs. Um, really, there's been an acceleration over the last 10 years where we've got to a point where a company like Sotheby's was, was very excited to get into the market. When Sotheby's entered the market in 2016, African artists accounted for less than 0.1% of the global art market. We have made significant inroads since then. We have seen uh, growth in our sales and our turnover year after year. And I should point out that the um, using auction sales as a metric is a, quite a useful one because our sales are very public. We publish our results. Um, and so we can track that growth in a way that you can't always track numbers um, in the primary market or with the commercial galleries. So I'm glad to say from 0.1% or less than 0.1% in 2016, we're closer to one to 2% today. But as you can see, there's a long way to go to realize the potential of the market on the continent. 
this audience knows better than anyone, Africa is a huge continent. And please forgive me when I talk about Africa or when I talk about African art, I realize that I'm generalizing and there's many more nuances to the continent than I'm going to be able to get into today. But we are talking about, like I say, a geography which perhaps has been historically overlooked or barriers, real physical barriers or geographical barriers to artists having access to that kind of Western art market. So we've seen huge growth over the last, um, I mean, seven years, forgive my maths, um, since we started these sales, but one to two percent is really not nearly close to the true representation of Africa, which would be closer to 20 percent. If we're thinking about the population of Africa compared to the world, we're 18 to 20 percent of the world's population live in Africa. And of course, there's a much wider diaspora beyond that. So that's a huge um, audience and potential buying power from the African continent, as well, of course, the subject of today's talk is the talent on the continent of which there is no doubt and it's almost limitless I would say. So these are just some visuals from Sotheby's. The other thing that we've seen in the, the, the marketplace is the rise of these um, art um, fairs and I think lesson number one or kind of the thing to note number one is the access to the art market for artists who are living in Africa. So historically during the 20th century really the 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 opportunities were limited and I'm glad to say that they are growing every single year um, we're still we still have a long way to go and there are a lot of plans being made today but at least today we have things like the 154 art fair which started in London in 20, 2012 but now takes place in London New York Paris and Marrakesh um, on an annual basis in each of those cities providing a platform for galleries from the continent and galleries who represent artists from the continent to come together for um, a dedicated fair and a dedicated audience. Uh, we also have, of course, art fairs on the continent itself. So the Johannesburg Art Fair being the earliest one, which I think started in 20, 2009, uh, the Cape Town Art Fair, more recently ArtX in Lagos. So there are more opportunities for artists to have their work shown in that commercial setting on the continent as well as internationally as well. Um, there's also been a growing press interest in, 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 in the market. So these are just some articles about our sales at Sotheby's, but we, we see more traction or more attention on African art in the press than pretty much any other category at Sotheby's other than maybe sneakers, but that's a discussion for another day. Um, and not just at Sotheby's, of course, but it is a story which gains a lot of attention and deserves to do. Um, but we're in a point right now, I think, where uh, there is a lot of hype in the market. Africa has been very trendy or fashionable, if you will, um, over the last few years. So we've really come of age, if, if you forgive the kind of cliche, where when I started these sales nearly 20 years ago, only really the people who are already collecting understood what I did. Today, it's much more mainstream. It's much, people understand that African art is here to stay, that African artists deserve to have the same kind of audience and the same platform as their international peers. Um, but we're in a stage right now where there, and how do you then, how do you take that market hype or that attention or being in fashion and make sure that you can turn that into something sustainable where you're going to have a very long career and where you, um, where you're not going to fall out of fashion as easily as you fell into fashion, if you will. I already said that I'm going to take it for granted that, that, that the artists that I'm speaking to or the artists that we're talking about have talent. There's no question that the, the talent on the continent is, is phenomenal. Um, but sadly, uh, the, the success of an artist doesn't rely purely on talent, and I wish it did. Um, there are some uh, interesting market reports out there. This one was published last year by Art Tactic, where you can see the growing interest in African artists, a huge growing interest. I mean, 44% in a year is unheard of in other categories. Um, and what you'll also see from, from these notes is the interest uh, lies mainly in younger artists and increasingly female artists as well. So there are definitely good news stories. And again, I would just say that the, the key is really to make the most of this attention and then turn it into something um, sustainable and long lived. 
Um, I wanted to use just a few um, personal anecdotes and case studies from my career, which might be interesting to this audience. My first sale at Sotheby's in 2016 was actually not a African art auction, but it was the collection of David Bowie, the musician, who was a great art collector and he had spent time in South Africa. Actually, he went to the first Johannesburg Biennale in 1990, sorry, yes, 1990. 1995, I think it was actually, um, where he wrote a piece for um, Modern Paintings magazine, where he was the editor, and he interviewed a lot of artists from Africa and he acquired works um, for his own collection, which I was very privileged and lucky to sell um, after he passed away. And one of those artists was Rommel Tatsume, who is uh, one of my favorite artists, one of my favorite people um, from Benin. Um, and he luckily was able to come into Sotheby's and give a talk to our audience about, specifically about his interaction with Bowie at the Johannesburg Biennale. But he said some things in that talk that I wanted to share with you, which I thought were really, really interesting. Um, the, the, the person who really gave him, he said, his, his first uh, understanding of the art market and really changed his fortunes was someone called um, Andre Bogotzi, sorry, Andre Magna. Um, Andre Magna was a curator at the um, Pompidou um, Museum in Paris, and he was the curator in charge of Africa for a major blockbuster show that they were planning called um, uh, having, uh, Magician de la Terre, excuse my, my memory there, which was really looking at um, artists of the global south, um, I don't think they use that term, but that term that's so commonly used today, and trying to give um, weight or balance between artists of the West and artists of the non-Western countries. So Magna was charged with traveling to Africa and finding these artists that he would include in this show, and Hatsume was one of them. And he, Hatsume at the time, he makes, if you're not familiar with his work, he takes found objects and he creates sculptures with them. So you can see here on the right, a photograph of um, Romold with a sculpture he's made of jerry cans, um, but he uses those jerry cans to, to make fake, um, masks. And on the left, you can see the work that David Bowie bought quite aptly, which is a, a long playing record. But he said that the tr trick that he learned from Magnin was, to make less, to fo focus more on his art and to charge more for it. So he had been selling these masks on the side of the road for not very much money. And all he wanted to do was pay his rent. And so he would make more work to sell it cheaply to pay his rent. Mania came along and he said, I'm gonna buy everything from you. I'm gonna pay double what you're asking me for it. And he thought this man is crazy. <laughs> And he said, but, and I'm going to keep doing this for you, but I want you to make half of what you're making now and then half again, but I want you to think about it more carefully. And he thought he was crazy. And then he saw results and then he saw museum shows and then he got representation. And then David Bowie came and um, interviewed him for a magazine and asked to buy his work. And he says that that was the biggest lesson that he learned was actually what he needed to do was focus on his art, um, focus on making the very best art, pushing himself, experimenting. Um, and if you, if you can find a good business partner, um, if you can find a good patron or a good dealer, they'll take care of the business and not to oversupply because that's the difference between, I don't know if you would call him a, um, a, a market seller versus an artist. So I thought that was a wonderful story, a really wonderful story. He also had a great anecdote about meeting Bowie and not having any representation. So his friend had to, had to pretend to be his dealer for the day and, and negotiate a high price because he had never really sold his work um, in, in that context before. Uh, story number two um, is on the left, you can see a work by Jean-Michel Basquiat, not an African artist. He was an artist from Haiti. Um, he is the highest selling um, black artist of all time. So we sold one of his works about five years ago at auction for $110 million, which is the work you see here. Um, he is, uh, the whole black art market is totally skewed just by this one man's results. So often when we talk about the market for the African diaspora, we have to remove his results because they are so weighted in his favor. Um, Basquiat met a young Ivorian artist in Paris, Watara Watts, um, who is a phenomenal artist himself. And he, they met at Basquiat's opening and Watara was minding his own business in the corner and Jean-Michel came up to him and he said, who are you? And he said, well, I'm an artist. And he said, oh, I want to see your work. Um, 
And he said, no, 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 why would you want to see my work? And he said, you know what? I wish I was an African artist, you're the real deal. And so uh, Jean-Michel left his own opening and, and went to Atara's studio with him and he bought work from him. But more than that, he said to him, I'm gonna, you should, you, what are you doing in Paris? You need to come to New York. I'm gonna set you up in New York. So he did, he, he was good to his word. He planned a show for him. He got him a gallery. He encouraged him to move to New York, which is where Watara has lived ever since. But if it wasn't without that support um, from another artist, he, 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 he never would have made it. Uh, Paris really wasn't working out for him. Um, so they planned shows together, trips together back to Africa. Jean-Michel was obsessed with Africa and wanted to go back to Ivory Coast, which was the only place on the continent he had ever been. Sadly, um, as most of you know, Basquiat died not long actually after Watara moved. But Watara is an artist now who's in his 50s and uh, he has been making art for a very long time, but it's only been very recently with the this new attention on the market where his work has really risen in price. He has some amazing galleries. So people like uh, Cecile Fakouri, who is a gallery in Abidjan, um, also in Senegal and in France as well, represents him. Um, and I think that's really, really key is having the right business partner, the right gallery that's looking after your interests. Um, but this last year for the first time, his work came up at auction and made, um, his work has come up at auction before, but made six figures for the first time and sold for 700,000 US dollars. So there's been a real breakthrough um, in, in his market and his recognition, which I think is well deserved for an artist who has been making amazing art and who inspired um, one of the greatest artists of all time. The last um, case study, I suppose, is Indadeka Akinyeli Crosby, who um, Natasha so eloquently tried to um, pronounce her name. Indadeka is a young artist from, um, from Nigeria. Her work has sold for actually more than this now. I think the world record for her work is about 4.5 million US dollars. She is an artist who, um, when I joined Sotheby's in 2016, so just two years before this world record was set, her work had never come up at auction. And in fact, very few people knew who she was, which, and she produces art very, very slowly. Um, to my point earlier about Romuald Tatsume, she paints, I think in the region of half a dozen paintings a year, if that. She had representation um, at the time of this auction with, and still does, uh, Victoria Miro Gallery in London. She's also now with David Swerner. And they had exclusively sold her work to museums. And so when her work came up at auction, that created a perfect storm for, for people who wanted to get hold of her work for her, their private collections, because it just wasn't possible. Um, my point with her, apart from um, being careful about your you know, production and, and, and what you produce, is actually the importance of the museums, something that is totally outside the commercial art world and yet totally in, in um, intricated with the commercial art world as well. So here was an artist who had never sold at auction before, wasn't in any private collections, but had been collected by dozens of museums with dozens more waiting to, for her work. Um, so that, I, and when she won the um, MacArthur Genius Prize a couple of years ago, she said that that was something that really um, freed her up to not even think about her commercial shows um, or her museum shows or her obligations, but just to purely take a year off and experiment with her work and become a better artist for it. Um, I think that's a, a beautiful way to look on your practice, even, you know, and I think that that commercial success will follow somebody who is being true to their practice more than someone who is trying to cater to their, to their market first and foremost. There have been other exciting developments um, for artists in Africa. I have some images here of museums in Africa that have that um, show contemporary art that have only opened in the last um, five or six years. The first being uh, the Fondation Sanzu in Benin, which opened in 2016, followed by Macau in Marrakesh, uh, Zeitzmacher in Cape Town, the Norval Foundation in Cape Town, and then you've got the Shilon Museum in uh, Nigeria. So these are the museums at the moment which cater first and foremost to contemporary art in Africa and the fact that they have only been in existence tw since 2016 is remarkable but also very exciting that there are now these world-class institutions and there are more in the planning. So there are more and more opportunities for artists to have their work shown 
in their home countries, on their home continent, across the continent, um, and also seen by a wider public, which is really, really key. Um, the other breakthrough really has been the international museums who have also been finally looking at the talent from Africa. So you started with someone like Tate. Um, I think quite a few of my examples are from London. Forgive me, it is where I live. But also, luckily, it's where a lot of these artists have been receiving attention from our international institutions. So um, Tate Modern in 2013 had shows of Meshach Gaba and um, Ibrahim El Salahi, which were their first shows dedicated to African artists um, just 10 years ago. And more recently, at the moment, they have a show of African photography. And um, Elan Atsui, the great Ghanaian artist, has been commissioned to do the Turbine Hall, which will open during Freeze Week this year. Uh, the Serpentine Museum, again in London, has had recent shows of James Marder, who's a photographer from Ghana, Kamala Ishak, who's a, an older artist from um, Sudan, MoMA in New York, obviously, probably the most respected contemporary art museum in the world, um, currently has two shows um, dedicated to African art um, and also had their first show of an African artist, Black African artist, only last year in 2022. Um, that really comes to the end of my slideshow and my, my very brief presentation. Like I said, I really want to focus on the Q&A of this. Uh, I hope my, my points have come across that the market is very exciting at the moment and finally Africa has become really mainstream. The whole world is looking for the best African artists, but we're at a point where this is going to become more serious and it's not just going to be the flavor of the month. People are going to look hard at um, who is making interesting work, who is pushing themselves, not people who are following the market, but people who are carving their own path. And the most important things I would say, and actually coming back to it, if you want to be an artist who's included in Sotheby's auctions, we look at three criteria. The first criteria is if you sell well at auction. <laughs> and so I realize that's a catch 22 situation. But the other two criteria are the ones that you can really do something about. Number one is who are you working with in the primary market? Are you with a great gallery who's representing you, taking care of your business interests, making sure that you're in the right collections, in the right, seeing by the right, um, you know, the, the, the great collectors, collectors who are going to really value your work and um, patronize you in ways beyond that acquisition. Um, and the second is the museums and the curators. What are you, getting in front of those curators? Are you having your work seen? Are you listening to them and looking at what work they're doing? Are you thinking about how your work might speak to a public audience or how it might work in a, um, an institutional setting? And I think all of that really feeds back into um, that market demand. And I think everyone who is, interested, who is invested in this market, and I mean that beyond uh, the financial investment, really wants us to, African art is not going anywhere, but for these artists to succeed and have long um, successful careers, and so that we can all feel like we were part of that ecosystem that thrives in the long term. Um, without further ado, I don't know, I feel like I rushed through all of that. I'm very sorry. I'm so sorry, <laughs> felt rushed, but it was such an incredible and engaging presentation, Hannah. And before we continue to the many questions, I'm sure that we have one, I'll ask that we all take part and answer a poll questions. But two, if you have any questions, please ask them in the Q&A box and not the chat box because the questions may get lost in the chat. Please take your questions to the Q&A box. Um, Hannah, before I get to the questions of our audiences, and from what I see, we have such a diverse audience, which I love, you know, uh, Bongo Musa from South Africa, um, you know, um, Amohelang from South Africa as well, um, Manyasi from Kenya, who's a collector. Um, we have collectors, curators, we have artists, Evans from Uganda. I mean, people are from all over the, the continent. Which I is love it. That's what yes. I love to see. Uh, and that's why I love this platform. I find it, I love the Zoom has changed our lives, hasn't it? That absolutely. we can have. I just wish we could all be in person together, but that, that would never happen, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> never know, never say never. Hannah, um, my question first begins with a personal one. How yeah. did you get into Africa? Uh, <laughs> well, maybe I should have opened with that. Um, yeah. I, I wish I had some great origin story. I, I kind of alluded to it. Uh, I've, I kind of fell into it, not quite by accident, um, yeah. but it definitely wasn't a 
obvious career path or career choice when I was at university because sadly there were no jobs certainly in the auction world or in the kind of commercial world um, focusing on on this market Um, so I have a very traditional art history degree from a western uh, Scottish university I then um, oh gosh this is a bit convoluted I then moved to Australia I actually studied in Australia for a little while and I joined Sotheby's in Australia working with um, contemporary Australian art, indigenous art. And I think that's where I discovered this interest in modern and contemporary art from non-Western countries. So yeah. both in the art histories that were so kind of under-recognized, um, but also in the clients, in the collectors, in in these kind of emerging I, I don't even think of emerging market is the word, but but really focusing on these markets where you can listen to the collectors as to what they're looking for and, and respond accordingly. So mm-hmm. when I moved to London, um, I joined Bonhams. I was the specialist in charge of anything that wasn't Western, which is a crazy big <laughs> task. Um, but I loved it because I hadn't worked out what my kind of line was going to be. And that's where I discovered First of all, South African art, followed by kind of art from the rest of the continent as well. It was the mid 2000s. Let's use South Africa as an example. The South African economy was booming. You have a big expat community here in London. Um, mm. They were very excited to see South African art exhibitions and, and acquire South African art for their homes. So it really started with responding to collectors from those countries or you know who already understood and rated and respected the artists. And they the African collectors are still my primary um, focus because they're the ones that teach me so much. They're the ones who tell me what they're looking for. They tell me the story, you know, why somebody is important, where they sit in the canon, what was happening. Let's use South Africa example. In the 1960s, when this painting was being painted, what was going on around it? So that's what I find so, so interesting about what I do. Um, so that's really how I got into it. And um, as the sale, we started a sale because no one else was doing it. We thought if it doesn't, if we can't find the content, we'll just cancel it. And if it's a disaster, we'll never talk about it again and we'll never do it again. But of course, um, the first sale that we had was hugely successful and I just didn't look back. So um, I've learned every, almost everything on, along the way and largely from my clients. So I'm very, very lucky. That's, that's fantastic. Um, one question, one final question before I go to our audience. Um, oftentimes, oftentimes at NF, we hear a lot of young artists say that um, there's a lot of gatekeeping when it comes to collectors on the continent. And if you don't have a, um, if you're not from a wealthy background, if you don't know the right people, it's almost nearly impossible to get your work, you know, into galleries, uh, more so into Sotheby's. I think Sotheby's is a dream, you know, so I think, yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to pretend there. there's no gatekeeping and you're right. I sit at, you know, Sotheby's is at the top of the pile. Um, yeah. That's not to say it's not impossible. I can, I can think of many, many examples. Um, yeah. Look, being an artist, like I said, is so much more than being talented and talent is key, but networking is a big part of it. That doesn't mean that you have to be born into a wealthy family or, you know, I, even in my own career, I've got, you know, making those, turning up at events, networking, um, there are so many ways to access the art market. Most galleries will have private views, which are free and open to everyone to attend. Yeah. And that's where you meet everyone, create yeah. a, a network for yourself. Um, networking is really, really key. Obviously, it's key in what I do with, with um, business development. But I think for artists as well, getting to know other artists, critiquing each other's work, um, meeting, meeting the gallerists, meeting the curators. It can be soul destroying, you know, especially <laughs> I can't imagine as an artist, you put your life and soul into your work and and, yeah. and then you have to take the good and the bad. Right. But I think networking is really key. The other thing I didn't even speak about, which has been transformative for the African art market is social media. So, again, like I said at the very beginning, there have been very physical barriers to artists say, I mean, it's one thing if you grew up in Johannesburg, which is full of art galleries and auction houses. It's another thing if you grew up in kind of rural Zimbabwe, right? Um, But with, uh, with the kind of advent of social media, artists have been able to put their work out there and be reached 
by a worldwide audience. I can think of many, many examples, maybe the most famous one being um, Amoako Boafo, who is now one of the highest selling artists, certainly at auction, um, and one of the most famous artists from Africa, from Ghana. Um, he was running his Instagram account and came to the attention of Kehinde Wiley, who is a, an American artist who loved his work and said, DM'd him and said, let me introduce you to a few people. And he introduced him to a couple of galleries. You know, one said yes, the others all said no, but the rest is history. So there, there it, it takes effort. Um, I, I wish, like I say, I wish it could be raw talent and nothing else. You do have to play the game. Um, there are geek gatekeepers, but that doesn't mean that if you're not worth it, then, you know, you won't come to their attention. I love it. You know, play the game, network <laughs> for yourself. Put yourself out there, use your social media platforms. I hope you're all taking notes. I'm going to go straight into the questions. We begin with Senegal, Sharif Khoury. Um, my question is how artists can work with NGOs to help them communicate in their work or, hmm, or show their impact um, uh, hmm, of their work approach? Um, this is an interesting question. I'm not sure Hannah is best placed to answer it, but I'll give it a go. You know, um, yeah. How can artists work with NGOs to help them communicate their work? And show yeah, them? that's a yeah. really interesting one. Actually, uh, yeah. you're right. I'm not an expert in that field at all, but there are some amazing, I mean, first of all, art is such an amazing visual language, right? I mean, beyond the market, beyond sales. It's a way that we communicate with each other and communicate with our public and get messaging across. And for that, that can be really useful for NGOs. Um, I, I'm sure there are lots and lots of examples, but the main one that comes to my attention is um, Amnesty International, for example, one of the biggest NGOs in the world. And they, um, they have an art program. Actually, we did a fundraiser for them um, where, where artists donated works um, to, to donate to, to Amnesty. So mm -hmm. from a kind of messaging perspective and a communication perspective, art is so important. And if an NGO can embrace that and work together with an artist, that can create mm -hmm. magic. Um, so actually, I love that question. I'm not sure if I answered it um, it was, <laughs> fully, it but, but yeah. it, it, it's ways of thinking outside the box or ways at, of thinking beyond just the like, the, the sale all the time the Absolutely. sale the sale the sale right um i think just uh, as a follow-up now we go all the way to south africa but uh, southern africa because the similar question in zambia as well um south africa sitembil and kobo um is there a list of curators one can reach out to with the intention of getting started on this journey and just tying me on to that aubrey wants to know is how can I affiliate myself to Sotheby's from Zambia? You know, are there any networks in Zambia or in other parts of the continent that, you know, um, younger artists or curators can connect with that could, you know, help them and help expose them to, you know, that's a great question. Um, I, I might be not thinking of one that exists, but I think there is a need for one. Um, it would be really interesting if there was some way to create that network, because I do think there are so many interesting conversations um, mm. across the continent. Um, and often I'll find them in pockets. You know, it's interesting. I'm very lucky in my job. I, I try and cover the entire African continent. It's a big slash impossible job but it means I travel and it means I know people all over the continent and often I'll be in Nigeria and they'll be talking about a specific problem and I think oh well you know there are people I know in Kenya who are working on that like maybe you guys should talk so I do yeah. think that networking is key I'm not sure that we have the elegant solution yet but I'd like to think that maybe it's coming as, okay. a, as, as regards to kind of lists of curators and things um uh, there is a really great newsletter that I that I subscribe to that I get so much of my intelligence from, which is uh, Culture Type. Um, so that okay. is a Culture Type. So they have a weekly newsletter where they everything black art related. So artists who are doing interesting shows, things that are coming up at auction, um, curators that have been appointed all of that that's a really great way to to get that um and i'm sure there are others where that comes from as well um yeah. but i can't think of kind of big 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 organization or yeah. uh, network that exists but i'd love to think that maybe someone could create it because i'd definitely support that yeah. um the second or the part of that question was how you can be affiliated with sotheby's um i mean the 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 kind of ironic thing is that we we rarely work with artists when it comes to selling artwork. So we, I should have said that at the top of my my talk, uh, we're, we're, we work in the secondary market. So pieces that come up at auction have usually been bought or acquired already. So if you sell a work through your gallery, 
And then the buyer in five, 10 years time needs to sell it for whatever reason. The big reasons that things come up at auction are the three Ds, which is divorce, yeah. death, and debt. They're traditionally <laughs> the ways, the reasons that things get sold. Um, yeah. So usually we wouldn't um, work directly with an artist. Again, I really encourage the artist to work with their gallery. If um, yeah. if they have a good relationship with their, their business partner, with their gallery, um, yeah. then they wouldn't be looking to, to kind of jump into a, an auction situation because the gallery will really look after who the work is going to, that kind of thing. So um, yeah, we I already mentioned the criteria for getting into a Sotheby's auction tends to be, um, well, that, which gallery are you with, which collections are you in, what museums are showing your work, that kind of thing. So tying into that, because it's a similar question, you know, um, there's a question here. What What's the three best ways, in fact, they want three, not one, to get noticed in the right spaces, other than networking, of course? You know, can they stand somewhere with a billboard and say, look at me, look at me. What do they need to do to get access to the right spaces? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I feel like I, I've mentioned this already. It's very, I mean, it's very hard to get to the attention of a, even a good gallerist or a good curator because those people get inundated <laughs> with emails, with requests, with look at me, look yeah. at me requests. Mm -hmm. So I think the number one thing is to focus on your practice, make good art, you know, and, and listen to, to, to the feedback that you get. Social media is a really, really obvious way to do that. You know, focus on what you're putting out there keep that conversation going and, and, and build your audience from there. That's, I know that's how so many galleries and um, curators find the artists that they're looking for. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I can come up with kind of three hot points. Um, yeah, that but was definitely, <laughs> but um, definitely think, focus on making great work. That is, yeah. that is your job as an artist, number one. Um, um, I'll request once again that you type your questions into the chat box, in the Q&A. <laughs> Not the chat box, please. So, because I'm unable to see the questions in the chat. Um, so we we have a question from Han Angela Marutu. Um, you have mentioned severally the importance of having a good business partner. Please speak more about this from the perspective of an artist. I find that a lot of artists don't understand the ecosystems in the art world and how they feed into each other. And it's often oftentimes a challenge when starting out. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, and it's easier said than done, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing is that if you are, the word gatekeepers was mentioned earlier, and um, it's actually a really important word. And it's important to understand how that market works. So when it comes to, to representation, you, I mean, it can be anything from the biggest art gallery, music or commercial gallery in the world being Gagosian, mm -hmm. down to, you know, working with a partner who's just always kind of promoting your work and finding buyers for it. Yeah. Um, and, and you tend to work up through the ranks, right? So yeah. you'll go from a smaller local gallery to a slightly bigger gallery to a gallery, hopefully one day that has galleries all over the world. Um, yeah. And you don't tend to jump straight to those big, big, big galleries. The point in having a great gallery is that they do take care of the business. Um, mm -hmm. you, can, you can concentrate on making great work. They find your buyers. They make sure the sales are made. They protect your legal interests, all of that. It's so important. It's very, very, I can think of a couple of artists who, who have made names for themselves without, but it's very, very difficult and I wouldn't recommend it. Um, how do you find the galleries? You, um, I, I'm, I mean, it, it, it sounds, um, uh, obvious or it sounds kind of simple but social media is so important and and networking locally you'll probably get some success locally before you find international success that's usually the way it works the other thing we didn't even really talk about is um collectors who 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 loves your work who are you who are you selling to often artists will sell certainly in the earlier days straight from the studio um you know um or 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 are you looking at we didn't talk about um, artist residencies and and kind of university programs, so MFA programs, um, as well as kind of adding to your canon of knowledge and 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 practice. But those are where the the gatekeepers, if you if you don't can't think of a better word right now, um, often find the talent. So um, ISCP, which was one the one of the um, charities that we raised money for last year, which is a, a residency program in New York, that is famous for galleries going in and looking at who's in residence and looking at their work and signing them up. So thinking about, you know, where, how can you 
challenge yourself? How can you mix it up? Can you, could you think about doing a university course? Would you think about, you know, doing a residency in another country? Those are ways to maybe, if you don't feel like you're getting success where you are, maybe that's a way to, to mix things up, meet new people and, and come to the attention of, of, those, um, of those professionals as well. I'm, I'm, I think just following up on that, um, Hannah, does Sotheby's have a requirement that a lot of the galleries that they work with should have um, a rural engagement? Because while a lot of people have access to the internet, social media and galleries in urban areas, um, that's not the same for rural artists. Um, you know, um, you mentioned, for example, rural Zimbabwe, even in rural Kenya, um, I can count on one hand, you know, the people who have access to galleries. And, and so how do we, is there a criteria that you use as Sotheby's to ensure that, you know, you're not just um, getting the cream of the crop from the urban areas, but, you know, there's some local uh, representation? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, it's, it's, I don't know if I'm going to give you a satisfactory answer because we really do at Sotheby's, we really focus on the top end of the market. So those artists yeah. should already have should be considered important, uh, should already have a following. Okay. It's not okay. really, we don't really discover new talent. That, yeah. that, that's not what we do. But yeah. you're right. I mean, yes, it's a problem in Africa. It's a problem worldwide. If you, if, you, if you live in an urban city where you have access to public art museums and an education and all of that, you're far more, and even then it's difficult to become a mm -hmm. successful artist. Yeah. The reason I brought up Zimbabwe earlier is actually it's a country where the ecosystem is lacking and yet there's enormous following for Zimbabwean art at the moment and coming to the attention of the world and that comes yeah. down to the the sheer creativity that's coming out of that country and a few key people people like uh, Valerie at Art, um, First Floor Gallery in Harare who's going out you know <laughs> get, getting in her car and discovering this talent so it, it it's really there's so much work still to be done it's about building that ecosystem it's about having players not just the artists like i said the talent is there the artists are there but having the the collectors but also the writers the academics you know building a whole infrastructure that means that um if 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 an artist is there wanting to, to pursue a career, that that we can help them get there as well. And and a lot of that's you're right. A lot of that still needs to be done. There are hubs in Africa. South Africa has a very well oiled, well sophisticated um, art market. Nigeria yeah. is kind of exciting and and has been growing massively. Nairobi also, you know, you've got a, an amazing um, auction house um, in in Nairobi, which not just um, champions art from from Kenya, but also from the kind of wider East Africa region. So, oh. so th there are exciting plans afoot. There are amazing people who are making those changes. Um, and I'm excited because we're still at the very beginning of that. So I would encourage those of you who are not artists, but are looking to kind of get into the, to the art world to, to think about ways we can do that. Because that's definitely what, how I'll find myself where I am is, is kind of seeing a, a gap in the market and, and trying to fill it as best I can. And um, finally, we're getting somewhere, but it takes a lot of um, dedication. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, we're building something here. It's still being built. Fantastic. I there's a question here, and I know you've answered it, um, but I feel like if I don't get it asked, you know, people will be like, you know, Natasha, you're talking about gatekeeping, and you're gatekeeping the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, do you? Uh, this is from an anonymous attendee. Do you pick up upcoming artists and groom them by selling their work, and how can they be part of your, you know, yeah. Purchases. We don't really. Um, like I said, we we kind of focus on the top end of the market. That is our place in the the infrastructure of the art world. Um, and also, we we do have a responsibility, I think, with uh, with our brand to um, to. The way I see it is, if if someone is in the Sotheby's auction, that they have already kind of come of age or they're already at a certain standard I want my clients to feel or my collectors to feel confident that what they're buying from us um, are artists who are going to stand the test of time so we have yeah. to use some criteria that are already in place they're not gambling on a young new artist 
that's yeah. not to say that's not a valuable experience. And again, I'm going to point back to the commercial galleries. That's the place of those primary galleries. I think there's, as in my personal capacity, there's nothing more exciting than going to a gallery, meeting a young artist at their first show, maybe buying something. It's probably not going to cost a lot of money if they haven't kind of made it just yet. If you're going to pay, I could, uh, I'll give you a nice example. Enjadeka Akineli Crosby, that Nigerian artist we mentioned. So her work now sells at auction for millions as standard. Her mm. work, 10 years ago, she had a show in London. It was her first show. And all of the pieces were less than $10,000. Yeah. You know, someone or several people took a chance on a, a younger artist. I know that's a significant amount of people for, mo for money for most people, but there'll be yes. examples at every price point. Every yeah. artist who goes on to make millions at auction started out at a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars and somebody yeah. took a, somebody took a chance on them so that is really really important and that is as a collector really exciting you know you can't e expect all of them to turn out to be investments yeah. um but you're investing in an artist's career and if one in ten of those artists go on to to do great things then and you've been part of it then that's really satisfying I love that answer. So, and just to be clear, um, well, there is space for, you know, um, identifying new and raw talent, talent. That's not what Sotheby's does. So I hope that's clear to our audience. Um, um, I, I, I'm just yeah. going to caveat that everyone at Sotheby's loves art. <laughs> so yeah. I work in the contemporary art division, for example. My colleagues are out there at at studios in galleries all the time because we're always keeping an eye out on who's going to be the next big thing it can happen very quickly it can go from an artist having their first show to being at auction very very quickly if the if the demand is there um but it's not our job to to, to push them into the auctions it's it's we really respond to the market demand um but we're all we're all kind of keeping our eye out for for talent all the time absolutely and i love that answer so the you know, another anonymous attendee, which artist would you hold as an example for a creative and effective way of leveraging social media? Um, oh, God, there are loads of them. I think I already mentioned Amoako, who's kind of really a, like the poster boy because he really used that one tool at his disposal. And now he is a megastar. And that happened very, very quickly. Um, I'm sure there are lots and lots of other examples yeah. i'm yeah. drawing a blank right now and yeah. artists i know certainly younger artists and by younger i mean i don't know under the age of 40 most yeah. of them will have a social media profile and it's not just about publishing your work and that is important as in photographs of your work but also yeah. engaging with the community you know that's the best way to get things the best out of social media is if someone comments or gives you advice or gives you a criticism or says they yeah. love your work, engaging in that discussion can always take you places as well. So I think that's yeah. that's also key. Fantastic. There's a question here from Amhelang from South Africa, um, almost similar to the previous ones, but a bit different. Uh, how can one create a network for rural artists that have no access to these platforms? Um, and are there programs and opportunities for young collectors to assist grassroots artists with extraordinary talent? I think Amohe Lang is a collector uh, from her questions and I love her. I love her. <laughs> uh, I, um, I, that's a great question. Look, it's yeah. not easy. I think um, uh, I, I, you have to go online, right? For me, I, I think we all had a tough time during COVID, <laughs> a very tough time during those lockdowns. But what I found really exciting about that time was how I was able to engage with my international network. So beyond day-to-day -day life in London, who's in town, who can I sit down and have coffee with? It was, okay, I'm at home, but I've got my laptop. Who am I going to speak to? And we, even as a company at Sotheby's, we did these amazing talks, uh, artist talks, where we would have an artist, we had Kende Wiley in Senegal, talking yeah. to the Duke of Devonshire in the north of England. We were able to bring people together who, you know, in 10 years, we might not be able to put in a room together. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we all know that, but it's so exciting. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves, actually, we can we can pick up as, you know, we can Zoom with, with anyone. And so this platform, <laughs> and why I was so excited to work with you at African Unfilter is a beautiful example of that. You're already bringing together a network here. If we just looked at our attendees, there's some really exciting people I know in this chat. I feel intimidated <laughs> by them. Um, but that network is um, everything, especially when it comes to the African continent. And so during COVID, again, you saw this an amazing phenomenon where if you were a commercial gallery, it didn't really matter if you had a gallery in Manhattan or, or in Paris or in Mayfair. 
it, what mattered was your online presence and how good you were at using that and leveraging your audience there. And so that's really been a game changer for the African art market. And it doesn't, I mean, as long as you have a connection, um, you, can, you can work on that network and find artists wherever you are in the world. Yeah, I love that answer. Um, there's a question here from Doreen Bayer. How do you know which galleries in Africa you have relations with? You know, these guys just won the names, Hannah. Oh, they're so, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I can list a few and then other people will yeah. get offended. Um, yeah. Okay, let me think, let me think. The biggest galleries, the ones that like Uber galleries in Africa who are, because they are participating in all the major art fairs, the Freeze art fairs, Bas Art Basel, things like that, yeah. are the South African galleries. They are Goodman Gallery, Stevenson, Blank mm -hmm. Projects. They do not love artists just sending them portfolios of work, but of that's kind of they're kind of the biggest names. But then you've got really exciting names like uh, Relay Gallery in, in Nigeria, or mm. I already mentioned Circle Art Agency in, in Nairobi, who's one of my yeah. favorites, Loft Gallery in Casablanca. Um, I mean, they're all doing amazing work and they're not just focused on their own cities, but they're all looking for talent. I mean, the story about Africa as a continent mm. is a really exciting and really positive one and my experience is that I said at the very beginning that I started my career selling at South African art to South African clients or Nigerian art to Nigerian clients that's not really the case anymore uh, those clients yeah. are now excited about artists from across the continent and yeah. so the galleries are kind of changing tack as well um, and who else? Oh, see, I, I knew I would, I'll offend somebody by not mentioning them. First floor in Harare. Um, oh, they're, they're, they're phenomenal galleries and opening all the time. What I'm always impressed by is these young people who are taking leases and, and, and doing amazing work. Fantastic. I really like that response. Um, and I think, um, because I want to follow that up. I really like this question from Aika, you know, um, you mentioned that young people and women are making up a greater part of art sales from Africa. Out of curiosity, what other trends have you been seeing in terms of style, medium, yeah. form? Uh, I really like this question. Yeah, that is a good question. It's a very good question. Um, and I have to say, I mean, what's, what's kind of sad is that 28% or whatever that that percentage was of female artists it's still not 50 50 is it like <laughs> we still have some work to do there um but definitely um female artists are definitely a kind of i don't want to say trend women are not a trend yeah. neither are Af neither are african artists a trend but uh okay so what we did see over the last few years and i'm sure this audience recognizes is a huge appetite for black figurative painting that was mm -hmm. very very popular all of the art fairs, all of the galleries were showing these paintings, Amoako Boafo being a big example, um, um, we, and a huge kind of drive from collectors to, to, to acquire that work. Um, I think that we're starting to move away from that. Um, I feel like that, that became too much of a trend. We had yeah. some great, we have great figurative artists, but then we had a lot of kind of artists who were kind of jumping on that bandwagon and making um, a lot of work that really wasn't up to standard. I think mm -hmm. that collectors now are becoming more discerning and are looking for something else from Africa, which I think is meaningful. So yeah. that I feel like was a response to people going, oh, I want I want something African on my wall. Therefore, it has to very literally look African. I want like a, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like an, yeah. uh, like it needs you know, to be an African, an African person mask. in the face. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas now, and, and that's kind of limiting because not everyone loves figurative painting. I have clients who I've been trying to work with saying, don't you want to look at African artists? And they're like, well, I only like abstract painting and yeah. isn't African art only figurative? Yeah. The fact of the matter is abstraction was invented in Africa. <laughs> There's nothing yeah. more African. In fact, I would say kind of three quarters of the continent, their main output would be more abstract than figurative, right? Yeah. So I feel like we're kind of easing into a time where people are actually being more careful and and doing a little bit more research and understanding art from the continent mm -hmm. a little better and knowing yes there's figuration and some of the best figurative artists in the world but there's so much more there's sculpture there's photography there's printmaking there's abstract work there's you know there, there, there's there's there are so many uh, different um i always say if, if it, no one should say they don't like african art because tell me what you like tell me what's in your house whether it's old master paintings or 
um, whatever it is, I'll, I, I can find something that's going to fit in with your collection because it is such a vast and diverse continent, right? So I just think that that that, that market, especially that international market who, who kind of rushed to buy African, is now kind of taking the time to be a little bit more educated and think a bit more cleverly about it. And the other thing that's helping that, of course, is some of the museums I already mentioned who are showcasing African art and African talent. So mm. when you have an African artist or an African show at MoMA, you've got an audience of millions suddenly becoming familiar with your work. And that is such a game changer. You know, mm. the, the, the reason at the very beginning when I started reading about, the first African artist that I studied was Gerard Sakoto from South Africa. And once I read his life story, I thought, why, why is he not a household name? Like he is one of the most important artists of his generation anywhere in the world. And one day he will be a household name, but it yeah. takes, books being written and lecturers lecturing about him and museums showing his work for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's still all ahead of us. Yeah, I'm gonna take, if you'll allow me, Hannah, just mm -hmm. two more questions. Yeah, I'm um, really uh, enjoying this. Yeah. So there's one by Noma Zulu. Are there international competitions that you advise artists to enter to get them to market and fortify their profiles? Yeah, I'm sure there are many, many. And I think, uh, I mean, to your er the earlier question about networking, I'd love somebody to collate all of the different um, uh, competitions, grants, bursaries, you know, um, uh, residencies that are out there and available, because I think that that's a lot of work finding out what's available mm -hmm. as an artist. Um, but I well, I'll plug one of our own. So I am a, a trustee of the Norval Foundation in Cape Town, which mm -hmm. is one of my favorite museums. Um, yeah. And we do an annual artist prize. So it's the Sovereign African Artist Prize. It's the biggest mm -hmm. art prize um, available on the African continent, and it is open to artists from across the continent. So yeah. we are always um, uh, looking for great, great talent. So that's an amazing one. There, now I'm going to start losing. There are others out there. The Gallery 1957 in Ghana um, have an artist prize that's open for applications at the moment. Um, I'm afraid I don't have the name of that, um, but that's one maybe people could look at. Um, yeah. The, there, I'm sure there are others. I'm sure there are others, but those are kind of two of the biggest ones that come to mind. I'm, I mean, I'm going to take one final question. And guys, please note, I have tried to be as diverse as possible and to, <laughs> and to uh, re continental representation. I'm going to end with a question from Bukumi. Um, again, we've gotten a similar question, but this has a bit of a twist. How can one link up with art collectors who appreciate our arts? Um, but even I saw another one that I really liked. I was just like, we don't have enough time for it. Um, um, you know, um, which galleries uh, carrying photographic work have you found to be most compelling in, in recent years? You know, so I'm just going to stop there. Um, <laughs> Those are two tr tricky job. questions. Maybe I'll start with. But, well, I am not a photography expert. There are lots and lots of photography galleries. Um, yeah. Uh, one amazing place to go, and I realize that travel isn't always accessible to everyone, but like uh, there are photography um, fairs, so Photo London, Photo Paris being two of the main ones that I'm familiar with, which are amazing. And you'll find, I don't know, a hundred galleries that focus just on photography. Many of them show um, African yeah. photographers. So that if, if photography is your thing, if at all possible, get to those fairs in person, but even if you can't get to them in person, they put everything online. They put so much content, so much editorial, but also usually all of the galleries and what the galleries are showing online and that's free to access. So that would be an obvious place to start there. Um, the other question, will you remind me of the other question? The other question was, you know, how can they connect to collectors and curators? Yeah. Okay, so I, again, find, you know, find good representation, uh, work on your online presence are, are two, two messages I'm trying to hammer home. The other thing I didn't mention though, which I think addresses that question is be good to each other. Um, some of the most successful relationships that I've seen are artist to artist. So artists who are generous with their network. So if you are, if you have any kind of success, if you have a following, if you have access to, to the galleries, to the curators, why don't you say, I have this friend who's an amazing artist who I'd love you to see their work. 
so mm. many artists I know do that for each other, where they've made a sale, but they say to the collector, hey, you know, you liked my work, you might like to look at this person's work. Uh, there's so much that's going on in the continent right now, which is artists giving back. Um, mm. and, and that's really exciting. So you've got artist led spaces all over the continent. So people like I already mentioned Kehinde Wiley, who's opened an artist residence, probably the most competitive and successful artist residence, which is Black Rock Senegal. He's opening another residency this year in Nigeria. There is the Inke Shanabara space in, in Nigeria, another artist residency, but also for writers and curators as well. Um, uh, there are so many other examples. Uh, 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 um, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, Romal Tatsume, who I mentioned at the very beginning, he has an yes. art residency. Uh, there, there are so, so many of these artist-led spaces, um, which I would definitely encourage you all to look at. And, and if possible, that's a great way to kind of get ahead is if you can, if you can apply for their programs, but also keep that in mind. Always think about giving back as well and extending your network because I believe in karma. I think it just comes back to you tenfold. Um, yeah. And I think we all have to do that while we're like I said, while we're trying to build this thing, um, we have to be good to each other and give back to each other as well. I love that. Um, and what a beautiful <laughs> to end. Um, I, I would just request, you know, are there any final words, anything you'd have wanted to say that you were not able to say? Or any, any, any words of advice, support to young artists, collectors, curators, uh, you know, as in Kenya, we like to say a parting shot. Oh, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm sure as soon as I hang up, I'll think of lots of them. Um, I just want to thank you again. I've enjoyed this so much. I've enjoyed all the questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. Um, it's been a real, real privilege. My main message is that it's really exciting space to be in. Um, and so if you're an artist, just focus on your practice. If you're a collector, it's a great time to collect. And it's such a rewarding experience as well. And I mean, above and beyond the financial investment side of things. So um, I'm just so excited that, that we had such a big audience today and that you're all interested in this field because it's only going to get bigger and better from here on in. Absolutely. And before you leave, you know, if you could just tell us what you'd like to hear and how African Filter can help amplify the work that, uh, you know, you're doing as an artist, as a collector, please let us know. And most of all, please subscribe to our newsletter. My colleagues are going to post that, our website, where you can get access to our newsletter. Um, Hannah, this has been one of my most enjoyable experiences this week. I really enjoyed listening to you, you know, the visuals, learning about African curation and art and where it's placed. Um, not only are you a senior director, I'd like to say you're a senior advocate for modern <laughs> contemporary African art, which, which is extremely uh, wonderful to know. Um, you have been an incredible, incredible presenter today. We've learned so much. I'm really sorry you were not able to answer all the questions that were posted, we tried as much as we could. From my, on behalf of myself and the entire African No Filter team, I'd love to say a thank you to Hannah. Thank you to our audience. Thank you for always making time for us, for joining us in conversation. Have a lovely evening and the rest of your week. From us at African No Filter, have a lovely evening. Goodbye. <laughs>